Okay, sounds good. Good morning, ladies. It's Dr. Carol Laurie, and I'm here with Dr. Aruna Tumala. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, you did. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Aruna is an integrative psychiatrist, and I'm very excited to have her sharing her information with uh, my community because integrative psychiatry, as far as I'm concerned, is what we all need. And unfortunately, it's not discussed enough in the regular medical world. So welcome, Dr. Runa, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Carol. I really, really love your uh, introduction statement there. Yes, in fact, I, I started off calling myself as an integrative psychiatrist, but off late, I am actually owning the name holistic psychiatrist. Wonderful. Because I think integration uh, kind of came as an olive branch to the powers that be in mainstream psychiatry saying, hey, I'm going to give supplements, but I'm also going to use your medications. But in the more I've been doing this for, I mean, my transition happened more than 10 years ago, and I quit my job in 2016 that allowed me to start my practice with the vision, fully committed to the vision that I had. And so in working with patients since 2016, what I've realized is that there's less than, I want to say, handful of times that I've reached out into the psychopharmacology toolbox uh, as a first line. It's usually only for patients with psychosis that I'm tempted to do that. I but agree 100%. For, yeah. And uh, for everybody else, depression, anxiety, trauma, addictions, we have so much in the natural world. And, there's, and, and also, I like the term actually, let me finish the thought. There's so much in the natural world that we can do, whether it is food as medicine or detoxification or addressing uh, the needs of our soul, our psyche, when it comes to, you know, people experiencing uh, low self-worth. In fact, more than any other epidemic or pandemic, we are actually suffering from a pandemic of low self-worth. I want to, I want to say that because. Wow. Okay, well, let's, uh, there's a handful there because addressing the needs of our soul and our psyche and there's <clears throat> trauma and um, I don't know if low self-worth is the bottom line for me. I think that it's definitely there and women don't, we don't value ourselves enough. And I think there is a systematic suppression and taking away of our empowerment, our beauty, our strength, our knowledge by <clears throat> society and um, standard American life, so to speak. But it's across the globe, I would say, I mean, it's, yeah, okay. and, yeah. And I, you know, when I say low self-worth, it's actually, I'm coming from a very spiritual perspective. It's, it's our lack of, I mean, you know, if you see the, the rat race, the culture that tells us that we have to go to school, the slog in school, then get a degree, then get uh, married and a mortgage and, you know, then raise kids into the same system. And it it's really rat race from birth to death. And we just become a cog in the wheel. But there is so much more to life and living than just being a cog in the wheel. And, 100%. and th that's what I mean. Like, you know, we are failing to acknowledge our inherent value as a life, as a life form. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that, that I think, um, you know, and then when we become very meaningless and purposeless, that's very, very corrosive to our soul. No wonder we become depressed. No wonder we remain anxious. But going back to the original thing, so I really moved away from integrative, uh, the term integrative to becoming more holistic because I saw that I don't need to necessarily integrate psychopharmacology. Okay, I, I absolutely respect that. And I appreciate you correcting me because... No, I'm not correcting you, Carol. Yeah. This, is, this yeah. has just been my evolution in this journey. It's just been my evolution. No, I mean, every... And every, uh, you know, there, we all have uh, viewpoints based on our life experience. And I honor yours as much as I'm honoring mine. 100%. Um, I, I, you know, in my work, in my community for women with breast cancer, I call myself holistic breast cancer care or holistic breast wellness 
Yes. Um, and I am also an integrative practitioner because with breast cancer, my approach is it's important to take the best of both worlds. Yes. Yes. But in psychiatry, so to speak, um, <clears throat> as I see this too often that women go into their oncologist and they're having horrible hot flashes from the aromatase inhibitors that they've been put on or tamoxifen and the, and they're, you know, put through a process that usually takes a year and a half to two years. They're put through what I call speedy menopause of all of a sudden within a period of a week or 10 days, they're forced into menopause. That is a traumatic event. And they go into their oncologist and talk about their symptoms and out comes a prescription pad. And next thing out of the doctor's mouth is, yes. well, let's put you on a fixer. It's known to help hot flashes and it'll help stabilize your emotions, which yeah. makes me as a feminist very upset. Um, it's a very, fixer is a very difficult drug to get off of. It Absolutely. really impacts your brain biochemistry, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, for women who, first of all, are going through the process of breast cancer, and those of you who are listening who are not and are just in the middle as we get older, sort of the piles of life can really impact our psyche. How can we help women navigate this um, path they're on? Wow, that you know, you, you have, I can feel different parts of my brain. I know. <laughs> lighting up that. So here's, I mean, I have a question for you. So, so I mean, I do work with uh, women through the all all phases of reproductive cycle, um, but when it comes to cancer, has there been any study that has compared uh, aromatase inhibitors like tamoxifen with uh, sulforaphane producing? vegetables like okay so now we're in a whole different topic yeah. first of all uh aromatase inhibitors are separate way of blocking the estrogen than tamoxifen tamoxifen is a selective estrogen response modifier and aromatase inhibitors block the uptake of estrogen so they're two separate physiological I pharmacological see. drugs but the impact and aromatase inhibitors is sort of the same they yeah. block estrogen they stop yes. the uptake or they block it, and then you are put through menopause. menopause. Now, the question of have there been studies about sulforaphane or DIM use versus those drugs um, to get the outcome of blocking the estrogen and reducing the risk of recurrence? And unfortunately, the answer to that is no. So now, that, would be, that would be my first thing. And the second thing is that my instinctive understanding about all these cancers is that is because, you know, women, I mean, if you look at our human evolution, we've always had estrogen. We've always had progesterone. We've always had a teeny weeny bit of testosterone mm -hmm. and DHEA. But it's only in the post-industrialization era yes. that we are seeing cancer. So is it really that it is the biological estrogen that is at play that causing cancer? Or is it the xenoestrogens, which is estrogen-like molecules, which are in our anything that the pink ribbon supports, any of those products, you see xenoestrogens in that. So, so the very basic premise of blocking an important aspect of a normal function no, you know, you said that, it, you know, something. But wait a minute, wait a minute. We have to back up here for a second because we're, first of all, we're getting way off the topic of psychiatry, but uh, our mental, emotional wellness. But second of all, it's the issue of the issue with, you know, using tamoxifen or not using tamoxifen, being on aromatase inhibitors or not, or using Lupron or whatever. I mean, at this point, the woman who's been diagnosed, um, it's very difficult to backtrack her health enough to the point where she doesn't need to use some of these drugs for a short period of time. The mm -hmm. issue is how can you make them work for you? How can you talk to your oncologist about reduced dosing because they do have a very long half-life how do you optimize the environment in your body in all ways? How do you clean up the toxins that you have unconsciously been 
taught to buy and to use in your personal care products in your home to remove as much of the xenoestrogens as possible? How do you optimize your body's ability to process estrogen in a way that's healthier than not? Um, See, I mean, I don't know th uh, that, you know, you mentioned that we are going off the topic of uh, mental health and like, actually, no, because this is what I do. It's getting to the root cause. So, of course, okay. you know, um, when people come in with depression, I do look at their estrogen progesterone balance, not only what their body is making in terms of how much they're producing and how much they're excreting and how much they're retaining with the enterohepatic circulation. But I'm also looking at the effect of xenoestrogens. And this is important because in the younger age group, it manifests as depression, anxiety, acne. Oh, it's hair, horrible. Yes, 100%. All of that. But actually in the elderly women, uh, not even in the, within the breast cancer realm, these xenoestrogens and estrogen imbalance actually leads to depression, anxiety, postmenopausal, perimenopausal syndromes, but also to dementia. Because the neurons have uh, a very, very high number of estrogen receptors. And that doesn't go away just because we age. Our neurons are still receiving estrogenic input throughout our lifetime. So that's, the, so again, you know, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not here to, you know, I don't know anything about cancer chemotherapy. I don't know anything about any of these things. But these are, this is how I think nowadays, whether it is somebody coming to me for depression. Um, and of course, you know, I've, you know, because I stepped out of my lane in the, when I first transitioned into holistic medicine, I wasn't comfortable, you know, taking care of people's thyroid or their irritable bowel syndrome or their hepatic, uh, you know, fatty liver disease, all of these things. But then I realized that I had to like, I mean, to the extent that I can, I'm not prescribing uh, you know, medications to manage their diabetes. Or no, of course not. But not you can recover but, from diabetes. You don't have to suffer yes. with diabetes. A exactly. diabetes, I mean, I want to backtrack for a second. When you look at the culture of Japan before it became westernized, mm -hmm. when it was a pure little island and they were living without white people's influence of diet and fast food, like in the late 1800s, before white people started coming into Japan, they had all, no, almost no breast cancer. They had mm -hmm. almost no heart disease. They had almost no um, cancer, period. And mm -hmm. their diet was very ocean to farm to table. They yes. had beautiful organic soy products that they ate. Yes. And then the white people came in and the culture became European, Europeanized and Americanized and up went the cancer rates and everything else. Yeah. Smoking, everything. Yeah. So going back as much as we can to what our culture and our food and our lifestyle be was before it became, as you called this rat race, I think is um, very important no matter what the illness is or the diagnosis. Oh, 100%. It starts Absolutely. there. It starts yeah. there. No question. And in fact, you know what, the way I think of this, the point that you made is that it's not even about the everyday white man, woman and child. It's not the color because even here, pre-World War II uh, and pre-World War I, I think there was more similarities in how people related to each other across cultures and, you know, their relationship to the land, how they cultivated the land, how they raised their animals, how they consumed their animals. I mean, now when I tell my patients, hey, you go back to eating organ meat and so many of my patients, oh, yeah, my grandmother used to make us mm -hmm. do that. <laughs> I, I mean, I hear that so much. And I come from India. I grew up in India. So for us, eating liver and spleen once a month was a must in my house. We didn't Beautiful. like it, we, but that's how we did. I mean, and when we would get the chicken, it would be the whole bird with the geysers and with the liver and yeah. with every, everything, you know. So th this culture existed almost everywhere. So it's not, I think it's the industrialization. I think it's the commercialization. Yes. I, I think it is the mass... Uh, commercialization and, and getting these corporate interests take over, speak for our, I mean, even now we see, we hear talk about, uh, you know, GMO agriculture and all of these things. We, we are not consenting to it. 
you know, Beyond Burger, like before 2020, I did not see that at all in any of the fast food chains. Now, every fast food chain is offering plant-based meat. We never consented to it. So is the, I don't know anything about this because I don't go any, I don't touch a fast food chain. I wouldn't know. So what is, is Beyond Burger a GMO product now? Yeah, it's oh, a That's soybean. horrible. That's yeah. If they're that, going to that, offer plant-based, it should be non-GMO. Exactly. It so defeats the purpose. Uh, it defeats the purpose. So I, that, that, and again, yeah. all of this has been done without your consent, without my consent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, so that's, I think it, we, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's how I've, I really see commonalities in cultures and, and all of that and, you know, I, I don't know, that's just a little perspective. But going back, you know, how does me as a holistic psychiatrist, how, what do I think about, you know, starting somebody, uh, a woman with breast cancer, she's going through these accelerated uh, iatrogenic physician induced menopause, and then putting them on FXR? No, I would no. That, that's not what I would do. It's not uh, what I would do either. I think that's um, a travesty. Yeah. And then they come to someone like you or someone like me. And um, it's like they have a layer of medication on themselves and it's a very hard drug. You can't just say, okay, stop taking effects. No, 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 not, absolutely no, of course not. not. No, it takes that, a long time to get off of that medication. Yes, yeah, that's, I mean, yes. And the way I, I would say in my practice, we start to taper medications after about two months mm -hmm. of doing our work. So we- right. We, I mean, I use functional medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So we are looking at everybody's presentation in terms of their dosha or energy imbalances. So vata, pitta, kapha imbalances. Right. And our focus is on restoring balance in their energy constitution, which will result in improvement in almost every organ system in the body. Every organ system. Uh, so the immune system, gastrointestinal, um, you, you know, genitourinary, hepatic detoxification, respiratory, every system, the skin, the hair, everything will begin to respond. 100%. Uh, yeah. And when we see, when I see that people are about 50% improved in their mind and body, that's when, uh, and if, if the patient is also wanting to come off of the medication, then we have... A discussion about that and I institute a process of doing that it's a very slow taper I do compounding pharmacy and then there are certain supplements that I do recommend both Ayurvedic supplements as well as functional medicine supplements that we use and it's different for everyone so I don't want to give any standard supplements no of course not there are no standard not. supplements but in general what I find is that people are either having a vata imbalance or a lot more nervous system imbalance like can we talk wait wait Talk about vata imbalance because a lot of the people here do not know what this is. <clears throat> what is a vata imbalance? Let's share that information with the community. My pleasure. So in Ayurveda, we talk about the basis of our existence as being energy. And this mm -hmm. energy is uh, organized into three sub-energies. They're called as doshas. And these doshas or bioenergies they control every physiological function, not only in our body, but also in the environment, in animals, plants, everything. And the three, these three doshas are, the number one is vata, that's V-A-T-A. -A. It represents the air and space element uh, in our universe. And it, its main function is to create movement. And within our body, wherever you see the principle of movement, you can understand that it is under the governance of vata. So where do we see movement? Our heart beating, that's a vata uh, function. Circulation, blood going from one space, one part of, you know, going from the heart to all the organs and coming back. That's also uh, vata. The movement of food from our mouth going down into our food and then to the intestines, that is also vata. The endocrines, the organs, like the thyroid is releasing the hormones, but the, the thyroid hormone is going to every cell in the body so that, that also implies movement. Then nerve impulses, they originate in the brain, but they go down to the uh, hand or the leg. That's also movement. Finally, thinking. We always instinctively understand that the process of thinking involves movement in it. That's why we say yes. racing thoughts and, you know, there's no static thought. It's always so that principle of movement within thinking also implies that thinking is also under the governance of Vata. Creativity is also under governance of Vata. 
Um, the next dosha is pitta, which is fire element, and it represents the principle of transformation, meaning anything that you put into fire comes out transformed. Wood becomes ash. So in our, in our uh, bodies, fire is, is represented in the digestive fire or in the digestive enzyme. So when we eat food, you can eat a raw carrot. It doesn't remain as a carrot. It doesn't, I mean, if we, you and I, we were to share a carrot, it's not going to remain uh, as a carrot in you or me, but mm -hmm. that same carrot is going to become me in my body. Right. And the same carrot is going to become you in your body. So this principle of intelligence for transformation, and it's not only in the physical sense, but also it is in the form of the psychological sense. What do I mean by that? A life experience, again, it can be a positive or a negative life experience, but when we experience something in life, that can either lead to wisdom where we learn something from that life experience that helps us in improving the way we approach life, or it can lead to bitterness and resentment which can then give us a, a different kind of experience of life. That also, that discerning ability, that taking the, the juice out of our life experiences, transforming our life experience into wisdom or resentment is also under the governance of Pitta. The last I, one is... Excuse me, wait, wait. I just want to say to everyone and to you that I think that the Pitta element, and I see this in the women that I work with, it's very important not to get stuck in bitterness, resentment about your diagnosis. And it's normal to get stuck for a while, but if you can't transform yourself out of that, being stuck in that energy is very destructive for your overall health and well being and your transformation. So, for those women who are hearing this, if you are stuck, reach out to me. I will, you know, refer you if you need help to Dr. Aruna. I mean, you don't want to get stuck with anger and why did this happen to me? And I hate this. It's a very unhealthy mindset. Yes, we need yes. to be able to move through that. So sorry to interrupt you, but I just. No, no, that's a very relevant point. And you mentioned anger. Anger is a very cardinal symptom of pitta imbalance. Mm -hmm. So that, but helping people move through that, whether we do it through the things we do with through diet, through supplements or through, uh, meditation, all of these techniques can not only bring about improvement in the physiology of our body, but also in our psychology. And then the last dosha is kapha dosha. Kapha represents the principle of cohesion and lubrication. So How do you and spell kapha, please? Kapha is K-A-P-H-A. -A. Go ahead. So anywhere we see lubrication, like the tears in our eyes, the mucus in our nose, the saliva in our mouth, the digestive uh, the uh, mucous membrane lining our whole digestive tract, um, all of that, and even in our joints, um, the, the, the secretions in our uh, skin, the lubrication that we have in our hair, in our skin, all of that indicates the kapha principle. And kapha really is about bringing things together. And that is the also the, the psychological quality of Kapha people is that they're also the, the matriarch. They're the nurturing. They're, they bring people together. They, they are the glue that holds the family together. And it can be both in men as well as in women. We see that. But that's Kapha uh, energy for, for you. Um, and so in terms of we were talking about psychiatric medication withdrawal, I typically see that either they're present with Vata imbalance, especially with antidepressants, which can manifest as brain zaps. It can manifest as jitteriness, nervousness, uh, even uh, fasciculations in the body where certain, you know, they feel uh, certain groups of muscles kind of twitching on its own. Those are called fasciculations. All of these things can happen, but it can also result in pitta imbalance where there is mood instability, anger, feelings of nausea and throwing up. Um, these are all very classical and diarrhea can also happen. That's also very classical pitta imbalance. So when we are, when I'm working with somebody and they're going through this uh, medication uh, taper, um, and if this, when I see these symptoms, because of my training in Ayurvedic medicine, I'm immediately thinking, oh, this is vata, this is pitta imbalance. And there are uh, very uh, protocols that we have that can balance this. Uh, mm -hmm. And it can be in the form of dietary changes, supplements, and even the way, like somebody that is very vata imbalanced, grounding them, whether it could be a, 
uh, a PEMF mat, um, the uh, the uh, the beamer mat, or these EMF. Oh, I love mats. the beam. I love the beamer mat. They can be very grounding because they will ground this excess vata energy and bring it down to the frequency of our Earth's vibration, which is very balancing to vata. So grounding. I mean, you, if you don't have a PEMF. Um, beamer mat you could ground especially this is a you good can time walk barefoot you can walk in bare the, on the grass and yes. go for a walk in nature yes <laughs> and even you know the, i think the japanese call it shinrin yoku forest bathing so yes. you, you don't have to be barefoot for that but if you're just surrounding yourself with the natural energy vibration of the forest <laughs> all these emf <laughs> emitting cell towers uh, that also can be grounding for our vata energy. I think it's very sad that there is a thing now called forest bathing. Because <laughs> it means that, I mean, it, we've come so far from nature that we now have to do something called forest bathing. I yes. think it's, I mean, it's wonderful that people do it, but it's also like, what the heck is going on that, you know, there are now courses on forest bathing. I mean, everybody should know and it should be part of our lives. I'm just going to go in nature. You don't need a name for it. I, I completely agree with you. And this is, you know, this is the thing that really uh, annoys me nowadays is that they keep, I mean, until it is stamped by a study, um, they don't want people, I mean, especially these physicians and researchers from Ivory Towers, Um, we I'm lost you there for a minute but go ahead yeah no i'm talking about this law lack of common sense in in today's like until and unless it's there's a study to uh to sanctify it uh people don't seem to be wanting to you know listen to their own intuition and I'm like, no, I mean, uh, you know, people that are connected to the rhythms of nature. I mean, again, you know, they, uh, I used to have a patient many years ago when I was still a resident here in, at the medical college. Uh, she used to know, she used to predict weather because of how it felt in her joints. An old lady. Yeah, there are people can do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there are people who can do that. With yeah. especially if you have arthritic problems. It's yes. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, yeah, she she did have arthritis, and she could tell, and she was also suffering from migraines, and she could tell, and that is. I mean, that is energy exchange that is happening. You know that that's what we mean when I say, or that's what I mean when I talk about energy in the environment, and we can feel it, we can perceive it, and we contribute to that energy, and you know all of that. But um, yeah, and so with all of this, I mean, I think you know one of the things I share with my community is this bell curve, mm -hmm. and all of the studies and everything it's women are in the middle of the bell curve. And I say to them, you do not want to be in the middle of that bell curve. You don't want to be in there physiologically. You don't want to be in the middle of there from your weight. You don't want to be in the middle of there with what you bring into your home. The more you can get yourself out of the middle, you want to be at the end because that's where the magic happens. And <clears throat> Agreed. that's also what, what you're talking about and here's the secret everybody it's very hard to do that by yourself i mean yes you can download one of my ebooks and figure out how to detoxify your home you can stop going down that smelly aisle in the the regular supermarket because that smell of in if you walk down the laundry detergent aisle you'll know what i'm talking about that smell is filled with uh estrogen blockers, xenoestrogen blocking, uh, creating chemicals. It's filled with carcinogenic chemicals that you do not want to bring into your home under any circumstances yes. <clears throat> ever. So um, there are ways that you can easily get yourself out of the bell curve. But when you have a chronic disease or you're suffering from depression, you know, one of the things that really upsets me is when I see these commercials on TV for antidepressants. And there's one in which it's a, um, a image of a house and uh, 
the house is quote unquote a mess. The woman's sitting on the floor. What does this mean? The beds aren't made. There's dishes in the sink and there's, you know, and I'm thinking, well, when I had my little girl, I wasn't depressed, but my beds weren't made and I had dishes in the sink. What the heck, what kind of messaging is that for women? That, in, that first of all, why is it only the woman's job to keep the house clean? So what if there's, you know, I mean, so she's on the floor, she's depressed, she takes a pill and the next thing you know, the house is all spick and span. <laughs> the messaging of this commercial is so not okay for women. Absolutely. I'm thinking <laughs> what happened months ago that made this woman not feel well. Yeah. There is always a reason if you're anxious or depressed, there is always a reason. Yeah. I um, had to love Carol because I did not make my bed today. <laughs> to well, I guess you need an antidepressant according to this commercial. <laughs> you know, I have dishes in my sink. I better like go see the doctor for a prescription. I mean, ladies, <laughs> we need to become a radical thinking woman about what is what are the messages that we're being delivered oh, yes. by these drug companies? You're not yes. depressed if your bed isn't made or you have dishes in your sink or piles of laundry. And if you are not feeling well, if you're anxiety anxious, and I always think that anxiety is like this little alarm in your psyche that's going, hi, uh, you're not paying attention because you're really unhappy at this job or you need to start doing A instead of B, yes. and, and your, your ego goes, oh, I'm not going to listen to that. So your psyche keeps turning up the volume until yes. you feel so badly that you go for help. Now, if you go for help to your standard doctor, oh, here comes the prescription pad and the phrase, let's just put you on ABC drug. Yeah. Doctor, like it ever, yes i mean i will tell you so there was uh, i mean most of the times these emotions you're absolutely right they are here to alert us to something that's not just right within in in, in that ecosystem it, it could be within our ecosystem or it could be in the environment that we are in mm -hmm. and no emotion is to be suppressed or denied we the only way to work with these emotions is to i you know in my practice i say Face it, feel it, free it. You have to allow that to move through it. And, and you know, and through our life's experiences, we do have certain experiences that can make us feel really bad about ourselves, about our life. But that feeling bad is an invitation to see how we can get better from there. It's not to suppress that feeling. It's not to deny that feeling. It, it's not about naming it and blaming it and then trying to tame that. It's, it's not about that at all. But we do owe it to ourselves to always, always find that next bit satisfying thought or feeling. I mean, but that can only happen, like I said, when we face our emotions, feel it, and then we are able to free it. And then we are able to move into that next best satisfying thought. I can share an example. I have... Uh, sure. Yeah, there's a patient that I work with. She's somebody that was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but really she had ulcerative colitis that was contributing to a lot of inflammation. Mm -hmm. And she's in her late 60s. She also, she's a nurse. And then she had a head injury at work that went completely, I mean, she was actually looking like somebody with early dementia when I first saw her. This well, is head injuries will do it. Head injuries head will do it. I mean, yep. it's a head injury. It's not dementia. You have to look it's at the... Absolutely. Right? Yeah. But what happened is that she was actually, you know, uh, cited for not performing her job and she was, you know, basically asked to leave. Uh, but in fact, this head injury happened at work. I so mean, she needs a good attorney. That's, I mean, which I did. I Hello, did. She, the first yeah. referral is a good attorney. That's exactly what I did. But, uh, but then within eight months of working with us, all of the, so she was having gait imbalance. She was having word finding difficulties. She was having uh, chronic headaches. Again, everything started after that concussion uh, and attention concentration. She was genuinely not able to perform her job. A concussion is a very serious head injury and it's not like a nothing. It can, as Dr. Aruna has just said, it can very, have a very big impact and disrupt somebody's 
cognitive functioning on all levels. On all levels, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm, the sad part is that she had consulted a neurologist and they put her on opiates for her headache. Oh, my God. And, and she was already on Depakote and, you know, she was she was a mess. But within eight months, we were able to kind of reverse many of these things. As she was on a benzo and she was also on an antidepressant. Oh. Oh. Uh, so, it, so hard. A lot yeah, a lot have been able to kind of, you know, clear things out. And I don't see her very often. Uh, and she's only on a mood stabilizer, Depakote, which I really don't think that she needs it because there's a lot of trauma that she has endured in her life. And you know how when trauma happens and the woman is revolting against it, oh, you must be bipolar. At least, I mean, I can't go back and say that's what happened, but that's my hunch with her. Mm -hmm. But she feels comfortable with that medication, so we leave it on. But then every time there is a crisis that happens, that's when she comes. And recently, too, she came and she said, I need to, I'm, I'm just so depressed. I need to be on an antidepressant. And I, she came in. And then basically what happened is that she has two daughters and both of them are, are not happy with her because of their own parenting experience with her. And the younger one turned against her and she was blaming her for a lot of things and uh, and that's what pushed my patient into this deep sadness that her children are rejecting her. With the older child, she went through this. And even then she said, oh, I need an antidepressant. And I was like, no, you don't. You need to process this. You need to process this. Have grace and compassion. Family therapy. They need family yeah. therapy. I, sometimes, you know, they're, they're adults in their own lives. They're, they're not interested in all of that. At that right. point in time, you just have to accept that that's where your daughters are and yeah. do the best that you can. And she came out of that and she was doing well for a year. Now the younger daughter is having the same thing. And and she was, again, she was like, because the culture is like, okay, just suppress this feeling with something. But one session and just allowing her to express the deep sadness that she felt. And, and also, and I told her, look, you know, you're feeling like, like your self-worth has been completely decimated. But no, you, you can grab your self-worth even from this. So what if you made mistakes as a mom? So 100%. What if, okay, yeah. just for a pause for a second. There's this whole um, perspective on us as women that we're not allowed to make a mistake. Yes. And um, if you don't make a mistake, you're not living your life. It's impossible not to make mistakes. Yep. We all do. We're never going to be perfect parents. We're never going to be perfect spouses. And <clears throat> we're going to go out in the world and say things and not do something as well as we had intended. It is part of life. And it, hopefully we have the support to have it push us forward. So um, I think what Dr. Aruna is talking about is very, very important. So sorry about no, no, you yeah. bring up relevant points. Please don't apologize. I, so basically what happened is that, uh, so it really it was, you know, the, the, what you said, there is no perfection. We just have to be good enough, right? Good enough. It's good enough. Right. That's it. And from that point. And try our best. And try our and best. Try our best. Try our best. And and one of the things that happened, and this brings me, uh, brings a smile because then she said, oh, you know, my friend, I was telling her this and she said, she gave me an idea and I think there is some truth to it. And the idea was that maybe her ex-husband, the, the father of her two daughters was um, turning. Oh, I whispering, was like, whispering bad things into the kids. That's so oh, no, horrible. No, no, that, that was a hunch, but I said, no. No, that that gives you a lot of that gives you a lot of comfort to think that because it's difficult for you to accept that your children are genuinely angry with you. But in going down this path, you are invalidating your daughter's feelings and That's her true. perception of what it is. See, the two things can your daughter can be genuinely angry with the way things turned out with you. And you also can have genuinely done the best that you could have done in those circumstances those two truths can be simultaneously held yes and and she thought about it for a minute and she was like because what her ex-husband is doing is completely immaterial at this even if is if that's what he's doing it doesn't matter it's her daughter that is expressing her deep sadness and anger over how she felt treated mm -hmm. by her mom mm -hmm. and all we can do is say i am sorry that you felt that way 
and don't give any excuses and or anything. Just see if you can be there for your, if you have the wherewithal to do that, see if you can offer grace and compassion and forgiveness. And then knowing that you were good enough, you can build your self-worth from there without having to blame it on anybody else, without having to deflect this whole process onto anybody else. Just know that we are all good enough and that's, that's enough for us. You don't need an antidepressant to get you there. No, but you do need support. You, you do, do need, need you need you need emotional support to keep yourself out of that bell curve. And yes. the other things about antidepressants, especially SSRIs, is there is an enormous amount of research about the placebo effect yes. and how they actually stop working after 90 days and they decrease your serotonin in the receptor area. So I am a very anti-SSRI person. And I've done a lot of research about this. And it's very alarming to me as a yes. woman, how many women are, oh, let's just, let's just put you on is yeah. the phrase. Let's just, is the doctor doing the less just for him or herself? Or are they just giving it out to the hundreds of women they see every week? Um, it's a travesty. And I completely am with you. In fact, so many studies have shown that the more months that you're on, anti on an antidepressant, and it's not only SSRIs, SNRIs, and uh, all the you know, next best things in sliced bread <laughs> products. <laughs> sliced bread is not so great for us anyway, right? <laughs> it used to be, but I mean, yeah. But, not anymore. But all of these medications, the longer you're on them, the more risk of more episodes. If you're on an antipsychotic and you're at more risk of more psychosis episodes if you're on an antidepressant more risk of more depression episodes they they bring down our natural stress resilience our mm -hmm. ability for they our do. brain and body to adapt to our lives so they do do that so a hundred percent and adapt adaption is adaptation is very important yes. and support is very important so that's why <clears throat> dr aruna is there i'm here I have my, um, my Facebook page, my Facebook group, and there's thousands of women in there. And I'm not saying that that is a substitute for professional support, but I'm saying we need different layers of support at different times. And it's very important to realize that if you're inherently unhappy, number one, there's a reason. And number two, there is a path forward and a way out. Yes. So, um, Dr. Aruna, how can women reach out to you? I'll put it here in the chat. So the best way to reach out to me is through my website. It is psychiatry2.com. So I'm, <laughs> uh, it's a tongue-in-cheek kind of a name. I'm envisioning that the path of psychiatry is a new path. So that's why I came is up it with it. Is it the letter 2, two or the T-W-O? It's the uh, number two. The number two. Yeah, that's what I put. Yeah. Psychiatry2.com. So yeah. Oh. And they can, there's a, there's a, dis, you know, people can go and book a discovery call with me. Um, my phone number, office number is 262-955-6600. And people can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. My handle is at Trinergy Health. So that is T R I N E R. G Y health, Trinergy health. T R I N E R G Y health. Yes, yeah. That's kind Trinergy. of energy. Yeah, it's a very cool. Yeah. Came up with that indicating the three energies, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. So Trinergy. It's beautiful. Health. Yes, it's beautiful. Um, Dr. Muna, thank you so much for spending time um, from your busy day with me and my community. And I am very grateful. And it's been a really wonderful conversation. And just to hold on after we're done here for us to just um, have a short conversation afterwards. Absolutely. And ladies, thank you so much for being here. And please reach out to Dr. Aruna or myself. If you are feeling stuck, there is always a way path. There's always a path forward. There's a way out. So it's Carol Laurie signing off for now, and there'll be more later. Have a lovely day, everyone. Bye for now.